Hello, everyone. Um, so <laughs> sorry for the late start. We had some technical hurdles, but we're, uh, we're on track now. Um, my name is Brian Sutherland. I'm a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Information at U of T. I'm studying energy harvesting information systems, so e-waste, and can we make um, can we make electronics more sustainable? And related to that is my interest in software-defined radio and various applications. Um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about that today. Um, so um, broadcasting has always been a kind of protest space. Um, so there's this excellent book called Low Power to the People by uh, Christina Dunbar Hester. And then, then there's been a various um, media entries like Pump Up the Volume, Pirate Radio, and even Smokey and the Bandit, although of course uh, it's very dated about you know people using CB radios and such. And uh, more, more of late, the New York City mesh, which uh, you know we've been talking about a little bit in, in our networks. Um, but the history of this, it goes back quite a ways in the sense that, uh, I mean, networks in the electromagnetic space were actually about defense of the realm. So here we have you know, the radar stations in England, which uh, you know, basically they were using for advance warning of, uh, of bombers. And of course, um, they also ones too and uh, you can sort of see an early image of you know this person looking at radar um, that of course is was also the case in Canada during the Cold War so there was the uh, distant early warning line of uh, you know trying to detect Soviet bombers then there was the mid Canada line which sort of cuts across Hudson Bay and um, that particular one is of interest because my father actually worked up in the mid Canada line so uh, basically, these were radar stations in the Arctic. This particular one is from the dew line, so way up in the Arctic. Uh, but this particular one here is is more like uh, what the the um, mid Canada line was like. And uh, my father told me about his uh, team of huskies that he used to go between the different stations. And uh, he, uh, he when they shut it down, he, he was always sad about uh, having to leave the dogs. He wasn't sure what was going to happen to them. But anyhow. Uh, this is what it looks like today. So you can see it's kind of deserted. And uh, the government has spent maybe about $100 million uh, cleaning up all these old radar stations because they're filled with all kinds of electronic waste. Um, if you look at it on Google Maps, it's interesting. You can't really get a clear shot of it. So I'm not quite sure why that is, but I just thought I'd throw that in. Anyhow, uh, I was going to tell you a little bit about uh, Dunn's Hertzian Tales. So, in 2005, uh, Anthony Dunn and Fiona Rabi um, worked on these series of art projects which had to do with uh, looking at electromagnetic space. And um, they did this thing where, you know, if they drove around in a car with a built-in radio, you know, could you look at things in a different way? So, for example, what if your radio would only tune to local stations so that, you know, you had to get a kind of cultural immersion? Or what if um, you could actually detect different devices around you? In this case, you can see so modified the radio to have like a baby, a little uh, bird's button, spherics, uh, baby comms, and also illegal bugging devices. Uh, and these are some images from their book. In this case, uh, what they discovered was that driving around London, they actually had a lot of folks who had baby monitors who were broadcasting soundscapes of their homes out into the street. And by driving around with a kind of scanner, and that's what a mobile scanner looked like in 2005, you know, they could get a sense of all of this, which, uh, which obviously is a bit of a problem in terms of um, how we feel about interception. Uh, so in this case, I'm just going to interject a couple of notes about the justice laws of Canada. Obviously, it's an international audience, but maybe it's of interest. Um, so intercepting things by electronic means is punishable by five years, potentially. And likewise, uh, invasion of privacy has, uh, if you actually record something or you disclose that you've recorded it, that's also punishable. So in that sense, you have to kind of undertake uh, exploring the electromagnetic space of a city very cautiously <laughs> in order to act responsibly. Because of course, there's lots of great reasons for sort of looking around you and exploring the space, especially now that we're having smart cities and broadcast objects are broadcasting all over the place. Um, and obviously this is a, a big uh, theme to do with uh, computing as well. They're now looking at computing science and the law. Now, in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum, this is kind of the spread of how things uh, are. So you can see there's 
gamma rays and x-rays and ionizing radiation that basically breaks down living tissue at the far end on the right. And then uh, you've got power lines at the low end of the frequency. And then in between, you've got like all of our cultural communication, radio and television, mobile networks, microwave networks, and so on. And there's actually this interesting set of devices which has grown up kind of in the center of that. And I've, inter I've interposed this particular device called the Hack RF1, which I have connected to this computer presenting at. Uh, and it basically spans between one megahertz and six gigahertz. So essentially uh, anything in the F band or into the mobile phones and quite far up past 5G. Uh, this is actually what the electromagnetic spectrum looks like as far as it's being divided up. Um, interestingly, this is the one of the United States. So the FCC was formed in 1926 when uh, Zenith Radio actually broadcast on a Canadian uh, wavelength and inter basically there was interference. And this caused the FCC to be created to ensure that like everyone was in their own frequency band. And here's the radio spectrum allocation for Canada. So obviously it's also very complicated. It's split into very low frequencies, low frequencies, medium, very high frequency, ultra high, super high, and so on. And if you zoom in a little bit, uh, you can make out specific uh, areas like cordless phones or TV channels two to four or FM radio or uh, paging. Pagers have a specific segment that are uh, associated with them. So, I mean, we consider networks as being like wireless and either 2.4 gigahertz of 5G or something in between, or maybe it's some lower uh, frequency. But there's actually this continuous spectrum that is vast. Uh, but it is important that we use it in a way that we're not interfering with anyone and not invading anyone's privacy. Um, so around 2010, uh, digital television was coming in, and uh, they were working on a way to make digital TV so that uh, they could basically decode digital signals from the EM spectrum. And basically, a digital signal is this sort of block of spectrum uh, around a specific center frequency, because obviously, um, high-definition television takes a lot of information. So it's not just a single frequency. It's kind of a set of frequencies, like it's a spread across a single one. And obviously, there are different standards around the world. So uh, ATSC in America, ISDB in South America. So these are ones that were developed. And uh, what happened was in early 2011, Finnish developer Antony, Antti, sorry, Palosari, was developing drivers for Linux. And he discovered there was a device mode for the Realtek chip. In other words, you could actually capture raw radio frequency data to a computer which means essentially you don't need to have all of the decoding in hardware. Uh, you could write software that could do any kind of decoding. All you need is a tuner, an antenna, and the analog to digital, which outputs to USB. So along those lines, the hardware that kind of developed was a kind of $10 real tech device. So I have one here. Basically uh, comes with an antenna, and it also comes with a um, changer, because in, in Europe this would actually uh, you know, allow your computer to have a, a TV signal. But uh, in addition to TV, it also is able to uh, read all of this part of the spectrum. Um, more advanced devices, there's the Nano 3, which is really small. Uh, there's something called the yardstick. Now, in this case, the one I, ones I've been showing you are read-only, so they would only listen. But uh, the yardstick actually can broadcast as well. And uh, there's one called the Kerberos SDR, which allows you to direction find radio signals, which is really interesting. So imagine you're intercepting something, but you're not quite sure where it is. You can actually direction find it. And then, of course, uh, the Hack RF is a half duplex, which means it can either transmit or receive, but not at the same time. Uh, and uh, these uh, cheaper ones would have only maybe a 2 gigahertz range, whereas the Hack RF has like 20 megahertz or gigahertz, sorry. So it can actually um, span quite a large uh, frequency range all at the same time. Now, of course, there are also a lot of antennas to do with this. So uh, elsewhere in the Art Networks Conference, I hope you were able to visit the R Open Weather, the Open Weather Project, which basically involves putting a turnstile antenna up and uh, capturing the uh, satellite images as they go over from the weather side satellites. So that's a really cool uh, project if you haven't uh, visited it be sure to do that. Um, but people have been making antennas across out of all kinds of things. Uh, in this case, uh, one person actually even made one out of an old umbrella because it's shaped like a cone in a satellite dish. 
Um, I've also added some pictures of some that I, other antennas, so they're specialized, specialized around specific frequencies. So uh, in this case, the blue stubby one is for GSM, so the cell phone range. And then this one would be more in the uh, VHF, UHF. And depending on which antenna you have, that uh, also affects the way your SDR uh, receives. And then at the very high end of things, you can actually put uh, 32 SDRs in the same card. So you can actually monitor a huge frequency swath, frequency swath all at exactly the same time. OK. Now, uh, applications are kind of interesting. So for example, if you, I've noticed that if I tune it to the frequency of my uh, car key fob, I can actually uh, see it when it tries to open the car. Likewise, you know, if you have a garage opener, uh, you can see those kinds of events. In the Windsor Star, Windsor is a city that's uh, near the U.S. across from Detroit in Canada. Uh, this particular person had a problem with her Chrysler Town & Country uh, van, and her fob wouldn't open her van door. And it turned out because uh, an S there was a person with a software-defined uh, radio nearby, and they were able to work out that uh, there was a frequency that was interfering with the frequency she was using. So in this case, you know, there are lots of positive things you can do with a tool like this because you can uh, troubleshoot. OK, so oops. I went forward. Now, in terms of the kinds of software that you can run, uh, one of the best cases is GQRX. So it was written by Alexander Sest. And uh, essentially, it's part of, uh, I have it installed on this machine, which is running Ubuntu. Incidentally, this laptop I recovered from eWaste. <laughs> but it works good. It's got a quad core, and hopefully, you're seeing me pretty well. Um, so I'll be showing that software a little later, hopefully. Uh, another great uh, software application is called Cubic SDR. So Charles Cliff is a developer who lives in um, Kingston, Ontario. Uh, we're, we're in Toronto, Ontario, so it's like a, you know, a few hours away. And it's a really great application as well. So what we're essentially looking at is um, a um, set of peaks around specific broadcast channels. So in this case, 99.1 is uh, our public radio in Toronto, CBC radio. And so I have this tuned to that. And you can see the output in various screens. And likewise, it's got this interesting um, flow diagram. So you can actually see the output over time and how the frequency is uh, changing. Because obviously, not everything is continuous. Some are just periodic. Like a key fob might just show for a split second on one of these flow diagrams. Another really good one is called Cubic SDR. So this one is for uh, IBM. And uh, in this case, uh, yeah, I have it installed on Windows, and it works pretty well. It's also got all the frequency ranges uh, shown, which is awesome. Um, now, in addition to like all of this software that's in open source, you can install and just use with these really you know, cheap sort of uh, dongles that you can plug in. Um, there's also the ability to uh, drag and drop uh, blocks of Python code in order to control your, um, well, what the computer does with the data as it receives the, the electromagnetic frequency data. So uh, there are all these really great, there's this really pack, great package called the Gunio Companion. And essentially, it's codified things that we would normally do in hardware, like a low-pass filter or a speaker or a receiver, and uh, made them into software functions that you can drag and drop and plug into uh, different connections. So that's pretty cool. And uh, hopefully, if there's time, well, I guess we're getting a bit short on time, so I won't be able to show you the whole uh, building an FM radio. But I'll post it for you, and I can show you how it starts off just so you see how the software works. Uh, there are also a lot of interesting test utilities. So there's something called RTL test. So let's say I wanted to listen to an FM station that's 99.1 megahertz. So uh, you can see uh, where it says RTL FM, the frequency is 99.1 e to the sixth power, so that means megahertz. And then uh, there's various other things. You can also pipe the uh, output of the RTL into a player. So that's what's happening there in the command line. So that's pretty amazing. Another really cool thing that you can do is many people have set up um, SDR that's in their city so that you can control it on the web. So if you actually go to websdr.org, there are all of these SDRs that are running in different cities that uh, you can actually control from a web interface. And um, essentially, you can um, kind of scan the spectrum of the city that you're not even in, uh, which is pretty interesting because it gets you, a, you can have a sense of all the things that are going on around. Um, and obviously, it's 
pretty useful for space exploration. So NASA's put a couple of them on the International Space Station. So in this case, you see where there's a circle there. Essentially, they've uh, put this uh, block of um, SDR functionality on the International Space Station so that they can receive uh, signals in any frequency, or obviously they have to tune it a little bit, but um, they have the best, probably the best SDR, it's not like a $10 one. <laughs> uh, so, um, and then of course, once they beam the data to the ground, then you can have computers work on it. So all of the digital work that you do for, uh, for working out the all is, uh, can be done on the ground. So in that sense, it sort of decouples all the hardware, which can be obsoleted by, um, in a way that you can actually improve things with software as you go. You just get the raw data of the signal. Now, of course, you could, I've seen a lot of other really cool projects of things you could do with this. Uh, for example, if you're making an Internet of Things device, why does it have to be on a specific frequency? Why can't you pick one of the unused frequencies by consulting the reference and, um, and create a device that just communicates on its own frequency? I mean, certainly that would uh, make it difficult to hack because obviously if it's on Bluetooth, other Bluetooth devices can see it, right? But if it's on a frequency that's, uh, you know, sort of underutilized or not used, then um, you can create these custom spaces that are sort of networked. Okay, so now I'm just going to uh, demonstrate it playing. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen momentarily, and then I'm going to restart it with the application because I haven't found a way to, um, to switch uh, things. So momentarily you'll see this, and... Let me just close. Okay, so I'm just just opening GQ RX, and I'm gonna share it now. Let me just make sure I have the right one here. Thank you for bearing with me. Okay, so the screen share is starting. So this is a view on my Ubuntu machine here of uh, GQ RX, and you can see I've actually have a few. Uh, destinations that I've put in here. So this won't work super well over streaming, So, uh, but you at least should at least get the sense of how it works. So uh, hopefully you can hear the audio. So this is a Q107, and it's broadcasting from the CN Tower. So I just turned the off of my computer down. Hopefully uh, that should help you hear my voice better. So uh, there are a lot of really interesting features. You can adjust the frequently, frequency zoom. So in this case, you can see uh, in the flow diagram here how it's working. If I pick something closer to the center of the spectrum, then um, let me just uh, zoom back out again here. So you can see there are quite a few different um, stations sort of happening in parallel. So uh, this device is actually reading all the radio stations, or most of them, at the same time. But we're only listening to one of them. So the capability of these kinds of devices is really vast, because they don't have to just be broadcasting or receiving on a single frequency. They can actually be on all of them at the same time. And then it's just a question of uh, how you commit your uh, computing resources. OK, so uh, I think you got a sense of how that uh, is working. Let me just show you a few of the other things. So in the receivers, um, there's like an automated um, weather station in Toronto. Um, so it's basically just a guy reading a recording of what the weather is. Um, so I've just retuned it to that on narrow FM. And you can see uh, the flow diagram is starting to, uh, so that's this peak here is basically the Toronto weather. Or I'm sorry, it's this one. And if I increase the frequency zoom, yeah, you can see it a little better there. So in this case, I haven't turned it on yet. Let me just. Forecast Saturday, increasing cloudiness. High 22 for Saturday night. Okay, so that's the audio that's coming off that. And essentially, so there are all these really interesting things in the spectrum, which are um, amazing to study. And in the sense that we're moving into the area, era of smart cities, you need to be concerned about the security of these kinds of things, as well as all the kind of opportunities that they offer. Because, of course, there's all these amazing things you can make, you know, spontaneous networks on all kinds of frequencies. Um, there's actually a lot of political reform discussion around uh, assigned frequencies to do with radios. So um, in the sense that Q107 actually is an assigned frequency, that's not the right way to do frequency allocation. 
they actually liken it to being like a shipping lane. Would you actually give a company rights to a particular shipping lane on the ocean? No, they only need the shipping lane when they have a ship in that, like, that's going across it. So in the future, we may not actually have assigned frequencies for things. They may actually be assigned dynamically because all of our devices are smart enough now, almost all of them, to be able to process that kind of information. Okay, so that's GQRX. And uh, I'll just show you very quickly. I'm probably run down the, my time scale here for questions, but uh, I'll just put this up so you can see it. All right, so... Um, new radio i'm just opening that so this is called the new radio companion i haven't tried sharing it but i think this should be good okay so in this case uh i built a kind of f uh, fm receiver but it's actually still has some problems with it you can see there's a kind of a red arrow saying they haven't connected this input to that output correctly but uh, you can get a sense of it here. So you have your, your Realtek uh, software-defined de uh, radio source, which I tuned to Q107. And then you might have a low-pass filter and a uh, receiver. Then you need to resample it in a way that it can come out with a speaker. And I've also added a, a GUI device for uh, adjusting the volume. And so all of this functionality is basically on the side here. So if I'm looking for RTL SDR source, I basically select it here drag it on the screen, and if I double click it, I can adjust the specific settings and connect the inputs and the outputs. Okay, so I think uh, this brings us to one minute to seven. <laughs> so um, I think what I'll do is maybe uh, pause, for, uh, pause for questions, and um, I'll post the actual uh, code for doing this that you can download later, but uh, I, we don't really have time to do it interactively. Uh, you can also email me if you like, and I'm happy to help you through whatever you're working on. But uh, anyhow, thanks for uh, watching, and I'm wondering if you have any questions. Go ahead. So someone seems to be typing in the chat, so we'll just give them a second. Okay, sounds good. All right, and I should put the headphones in because... Uh, I'm always talking to me over them, and we don't want you to hear that. <laughs> so hold on a second. So question in the chat from Dietrich. Can SDR work for mesh? Well, that's interesting. Uh, typically, it's about transmitting and receiving. So in theory, because it's software driven, you should be able to drive the hardware in a way that you could make a mesh network, absolutely. Cool, thank you. What would you recommend for beginners, hardware and software-wise? Well, I'd say go cheap. So, um, I mean, something like this is very inexpensive. It's only like 10 bucks, and you can experiment a lot with it. It actually has a really good range. I mean, it's only if you, you know, were really studying it, like I am for my PhD, that you would go out and, you know, get a hack RF. Uh, it actually has a lot of really interesting things that come with it, too. Like, uh, you can get... Um, a uh, Faraday cage, which increases the range. So you just have to solder it yourself. And likewise, there are all kinds of antennas. So um, yeah, I would suggest you get yourself a cheap SDR dongle and you can actually make yourself an antenna or use the one that they provide because uh, they don't sell them without antennas. So. Great, I'm gonna give it a few more seconds. Someone's typing. Oh, they say thanks, and there's tons of applause and stuff. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, I see Make Worlds typing something in the chat. Uh, Makeworld says, you held up a device in your response, but I didn't get the name of it. Would you mind repeating it, maybe? Or posting the text? Did you mean this one, do you think? Probably. Yeah, okay. So uh, in the description for uh, this workshop that's posted in uh, GitHub, 
there's a link to a store and um, they basically sell these, but uh, they also sell them on Amazon. So essentially what it is, is it's called an SDR. And these particular ones are called RTL SDRs because they're based on the Realtek uh, chipset. So if you Google the phrase RTL SDR, uh, then you can uh, try it out. Another way to try this out sort of without investing anything is to go to one of these uh, web SDRs and listen for a broadcast in another city because people have made their devices accessible over the web so you can, you can get a sense of what they do before you go and buy one. Awesome, thank you. Another comment from Michael here saying, not a question, but this is cool, exclamation <laughs> mark. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's really cool too. Uh, move your microphone's muted. Oh, I was just saying, going to wait a bit more. Oh, for okay. Questions. Sure. Um, by the way, I just got word from the other organizers. You have a bit more time. So if there's anything else you wanted to showcase for like five minutes or something, feel free. Okay, fair enough. Um, I'll take a moment and show you web SDR. So let me see if I can uh, share that. Unshare this and reshare. Mm, um, there's two questions just now. Uh, for recommendations for SDR and communities from SOX, and also what are your thoughts on Lime SDR? Uh, I think he probably means Lime SDR because that's a specific um, product. Yeah, I think I mispronounced it. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, I have, actually I haven't used enough devices to really have an opinion, um, but let me share with you my go-to uh, website, which has all this stuff. It was kind of a blog called um, rtl-sdr.com. And essentially they publish articles regularly about things that people are doing with SDR projects, how to's, videos. So, I mean, if you were looking for example, um, to uh, receive weather satellite images when they pass overhead, there's quite a few articles of different things that people have tried and how they work for them. Um, so definitely I would recommend uh, rtl-sdr.com. Um, the other thing is, is the uh, open source project called Osmocom. So open source mobile, I don't remember the rest, but essentially it's the cluster of software utilities that are that support this capability. And uh, they're maintained by various folks, uh, typically who sell these devices. Um, um, the other thing is says, thank you. And um, would you like another question? Uh, okay. If you have time, it's all good. Yeah. Um, are there any clear legal carve outs for transmitting without a license, e.g. experimental home IoT apps from Evan? Well, basically, I would suggest that you consult the spectrum uh, allocation for your region. And then you check the spectrum that you're planning to use to make sure that it's not allocated or it's allocated for experimental, that kind of thing. Um, so a lot of the LoRa space where they're building a long range uh, Wi-Fi was previously undesignated and unallocated. So that's kind of considered to be an experimental space. The other thing you can do is actually monitor the space for a while to see if there are other people transmitting it. Because, I mean, if there are people to interfere with, you'll probably be able to detect them. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the questions in chat, but you still have a bit more time if you want it. Well, there's an uh, I would recommend there's this amazing video. I can't re remember the link to it that I watched, but uh, about uh, the triangu triangulation SDR. So it's this guy driving around in his car with an Android, uh, huge Android thing going and basically detecting these transmitters, which uh, are really unusual, you know, um, so they're not like uh, invading on people's privacy or that kind of thing. It's just his ability to figure out that there's some kind of transmitter that's coming out of a particular building. Uh, it was really impressive. The other thing too, is that it's important not to have, I mean, obviously we're trying to respect people's privacy, but let's say for example, you did detect someone's baby monitor. If you bookmark that, 
that would be evidence of intent that you intended to invade their privacy because you are aware that, you know, that act is actually a station. So obviously you would want to avoid those things once you bump into them. But um, there's obviously a whole lot of, uh, um, I mean, we hear about illegal wiretaps all the time. So um, this could be useful for detecting those as well. So it's a, it's a tool which is neutral. The main thing is you need to use it legally and responsibly. Awesome. Thank you so much for um, questions. Doesn't seem like there's anything else in the chat, but fear, feel free to post afterwards. Um, I'm so sure Brian will be in there or maybe get in touch with him directly. I'm sure that'd be nice. Um, any last thoughts? Uh, just thank you for tuning in, and uh, I'm really enjoying the conference. Um, and definitely visit the Open Weather uh, Project because that's like a specific application of this, which is you know pretty amazing. So awesome! Thank you so much for presenting today. This is super informative. Thanks so much.